Good morning. Welcome to worship at St. Peter's United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're welcome here. Please light a candle as we virtually come together to worship the God we know as Creator Christ and Spirit. As always, thanks to our media intern, Ashley, for producing this video service. And we thank you for keeping your gifts and pledges up to date. As you know, we're back to in-person worship on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. And we're now singing hymns and praying out loud together. But following the latest county, state, and CDC guidelines, we're once again requesting that everyone wears a mask for all indoor gatherings at church, including worship. Now, here's a reminder when we come to the part of the service when we pass the peace of Christ, Please do that with whom you are worshiping in your homes or wherever you happen to be enjoying this web worship. And you may do it to the screen if you share peace with all who are a part of this web worship using American Sign Language. We'll share the peace before the pastoral prayer, and I'll demonstrate now. It's may the peace of Christ be with you. Joyful Noise Camp continues today in the churchyard, and they're learning about parables and how to make a joyful noise to the Lord. Today's lesson is about the parable of the lost sheep. And as we remember our homeless brothers and sisters, we know that nothing is quite as welcome as a pair of new clean socks. Throughout the month of August, we'll be collecting new socks for both men and women. We may drop them off in the collection box outside the church's north doors or bring them to worship on Sunday morning to the display in the lobby. Disciple Zone, our children's faith formation gatherings on Sunday mornings will be back this fall. Parents can find registration forms on the St. Peter's website, in the newsletter, and in the lobby. Sister to Sister, our women's ministry is gathering on September 1st. All women of the church and friends are invited. Again, details are in the weekly word and bulletin. Members and friends of all ages should save the date of Sunday, September 12th, as we rock St. Peter's. Games, a DJ, tacos, and ice cream will all be in abundance. Please RSVP via the weekly word or contact the church office. Our church office is open, but the church staff members and pastors work both from their homes and from the office here at church. So if you need to see a staff person or to stop by for some reason, please call first. And please continue to read the monthly newsletter and weekly word for more announcements from our council, boards, and ministry teams. But again, thank you for joining us for this web worship. Now let us worship the God who gives us all good gifts. This is the day our God has made. Let us be called to worship. In deep gratitude, we come to worship God, for it is God that we recognize the source of all goodness. For love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness come from the Spirit of God. So we come with grateful hearts, not for things, but for who, for who God is, and gather to show our gratitude in song and prayer. Let us pray. God of mercy and abundant love, we have gathered here this day to hear your healing words of compassion and be transformed by your love. Help us to become more faithful servants in our thoughts, words, and deeds. Amen. Please join me in the hearing of his word from Psalm 15. O oh Lord, who may abide in my, your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill, those who walk blamelessly and do not and do what is right, and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue, and know and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath, even to their hurt, who do not lend money to at interest, and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things will not be moved. This ends our reading for the day. Good morning, everyone. It's time for our Word for All Ages. I hope you all are gathered around and comfortable. This week, I want to talk to us about words. We use words every day, do we not? 
and words are awesome. I use the word awesome a lot. I don't know if you picked up on that. I love the word awesome. Um, we use words to talk to one another. We use words, actually verbally speaking, as I'm doing to you all now uh, over the video screen. I talk with my hands a lot, so I'm gesturing and pointing to things, and that's great. Some of us actually have to use our hands to, to talk because um, we can't speak, and so we use American Sign Language or Sign Language in general, right, to talk to one another. Um, we use books, right? We have books and we write papers, and now that we're back in school, um, and we have words that are beautifully written down in the Bible that tell us the story of God and God's people. Um, words are fantastic things. Now, I have with us, I have with me um, the bulletin from last Sunday. You know, this sheet of paper right here, and we don't have that obviously for our, for, for you viewers at home, but we use an order of worship, do we not? We do things like call to worship where we gather and we call God's presence here into, um, into worship, whether it's over the video screen or here in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings. But we have words and language specifically that we use to worship God. And it's written out for us. Now, is there a right or wrong way to worship God? I don't think so. As long as we worship God, I think God is loving it. And the things that we do in worship... Um, those words matter, I think, which is why I'm mindful when I put together worship for all of you or when I'm teaching, uh, whether it's our confirmads or our youth or even our adults, I'm conscious of the, the words that I use to talk about God because I don't think God is put into this tiny bubble, you know, where God is he or she. I think God is everything. And I think God is different for every single person. And to label God one specific thing as he or she or they or it or whatever just puts a little bit of a limit on God. So I try to, in worship, use words um, when I talk about God and God's presence, you know, things like creator God and loving God and healing God and Oh God, I use that a lot, or Oh Holy God, because God is so much more. And in worship, any of us, you know, some of us find the hymns and the words in the hymns are important. Not just the music that's coming from the organ, but the words themselves um, are important. And uh, the scripture lessons, some of us connect to God that way, and we love hearing the words from the Bible. Um, whether it's the benediction, you know, as worship leader, I write out all my stuff. And uh, I may not read from it all the time, and I may just go off and, and kind of do my own thing sometimes. But for the most part, I write things down. Um, it helps me to have something in front of me to, um, to say to all of you, the words that I'm going to use as I worship and, and lead worship for all of you. So we all connect to God in different ways, and the languages that we use in worship, it's important. And we should be mindful of that and how we think about God and how we talk about God. And it's the same in life, is it not? That the words that we use can be harmful to some, and um, the words can be uplifting to some, and uh, our language, the words that we use to convey our emotions, to convey what we're feeling, to convey um, anything, right? That's important. And it's something that we should be mindful of when we're talking to other people. Um, because God provided these words for us to talk and to learn and to worship and to grow as individuals and human beings. And it'd be really hard to be a human without being able to talk, whether it's verbally or the written word or even with our hands in sign language. Words are a huge blessing. And this week, I encourage you to think about the words you use, whether it's the everyday words you use or something that you said to someone. Think about those words. Think about the words we use in worship. Think about... If you're here in worship on Sunday or if you're, if you're watching um, on YouTube, think about the things that 
Dr. Wolf and I say as we lead worship. Think about the hymns and the words in the hymns and in the prayers and so forth, because those things are important because they convey how we worship God and how we express our faith. Um, so, and I also hope you give thanks to God for this huge blessing of being able to have words that allow us to express who we are as individuals and as people. So I hope that you think about that this week and be kind of mindful of the words that you use each and every day, um, especially when you talk to others, and think about and talk about your faith and God. So with that in mind, let us pray. Dear God, Thank you for words that help us worship you and talk to others. Thank you for the many forms words come in, whether on paper or spoken or when using our hands. Words are truly a blessing. Help us to be mindful of the words we use so they may be words that uplift others and offer you praise. Amen. I shall see you soon. Bye. Friends in the Lord, may the peace of Christ be with you. Shall we take this time to greet one another with a sign of Christ's peace. As we come now to our time of prayer, I invite you to keep those that are listed in our weekly word email as well as the newsletter in your prayers this week. We lift up Bill Schumacher and family in the passing of Betsy this week. And a joy, we lift up Jacob Hare and his new wife, Rosalie D'Amato, who were married here on August 27th. So in this spirit, let us come to God in prayer. Gracious God, we're reminded that words matter and that the words that we choose can either harm or heal, wound or welcome. May our words be used to build up the body of Christ, to share love and compassion in our broken and battered world. Healing God, we pray for those who have been hurt by words, for refugees and immigrants, for people with disabilities who are told they are not welcome, for people of color who hear words of racism, for those who have been told that they are less than, for people who have endured words of ju judgment. We know these are not the only ones affected by harmful words. God of the living word, help us speak the truth in love and to care for one another with words we choose to speak. God of healing and wholeness, we lift up to you our words of prayer for the people near and dear to our hearts, those spoken this morning and those nestled in our hearts. Hear our words of concern and joy and offer words of hope to those who need it. We lift these prayers to you along with the prayer that you taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
The epistle of James is the first of what are called the universal letters. They're directed to all Christians everywhere and not just to those in a certain city or a particular church. Now, James is really skilled at not mincing words and telling believers straight out what's expected of them regarding faithfulness and behavior. In just 108 verses, there are 59 imperatives or admonitions for how to be and how not to be. Let's hear some of those words together now. Every generous act of giving uh, with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they are like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. May God add understanding to our hearing of this holy word. Amen. The advertising wizards of Madison Avenue had a way of brainwashing those of us who grew up near the end of the baby boom. From our TV sets, magazines, and transistor radios, commercials with catchy jingles or slogans were around every corner. And alas, I am doomed to have them memorized and stashed away in my brain for the past 50 plus years. Just the cleaning products alone are enough to make one's head spin. Tide was designed with mothers in mind. It gets out the dirt kids get into. Mr. Clean puts a sheen where you clean. The worst stain, ring around the collar. And as the band, The Doors, remind us at the end of one of their hits, stronger than dirt is what Ajax laundry detergent is famous for. And of course, we all know the only way to get a tough stain out is to shout it out. James has a few things to say about stains in today's lesson, but we'll return to that in a moment. Here's a stain story. My wife Margaret still blames her brother for this childhood episode which took place more than half a century ago. Apparently, little David and little Margaret had gotten their hands on some of their mother's nail polish remover. David decided to see what this new wonderful potion would do by applying some to the top of a beautifully finished piece of furniture. Of course, the stain on the stain was permanent. They were both forbidden from participating in the promised horseback riding lessons which were supposed to happen. Stains. Let's look deeper into James' epistle. We'll be spending some time there this late summer and early fall. It's the 20th book of the New Testament. Most likely it was written around 50 AD 
which is 10 to 20 years before the first Gospels were compiled, depending on who you get your information from. The author of the letter is believed to have been James, the younger brother of Jesus. We do know that brother James was the head of the church in Jerusalem after Peter. Now, I'm not trying to psychoanalyze anyone here, but imagine what kind of inferiority complex one might have being the little brother of Jesus of Nazareth. I think Jimmy held it together, though. James seems to be focused on works, on doing, rather than faith, by doing, rather than just believing. Now, this drove one Protestant reformer crazy, and Martin Luther used to call it the epistle of straw because he believed it contradicted Paul's teachings on justification by faith and not works. Now, when we read this letter, we might get the distinct impression that James has been looking at our diary or reading our personal emails. He nails the human condition, and how we fall short. James was focused on the community rather than the individual. We do good, do good actions for the common good and not for our own good. In our passage today, he reminds us that words matter, what we say, and that we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, in our very vocal and increasingly angry culture, aren't these words that we need to hear now? And as I mentioned, James says, be doers. We're created in God's image and implant. So we must care for others as God cares for us. But my favorite words in this passage come in the final verse. Religion that is pure and undefiled is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. In other words, serve those in need and be stain resistant. Even Psalm 15, which we heard earlier, is somewhat stain resistant. Who may dwell on God's holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right. Those who speak the truth from their hearts. Those who, not, who do not slander with their tongue. Who do no evil for their friends and do not take up reproach against their neighbors. Sounds like keeping oneself unstained by the world. Like James as admonishes us to do. Now, what might some of the stains of the world be that we're called to avoid, like grass stains on our Sunday best clothes? What are the stains our culture confronts us with? Well, I would first name anything that separates us, that drives a wedge between people, any ism that divides, racism, sexism, ageism, or fill in your own blank with whatever divides us into us and them. Another stain our culture tries to smear us with is greed. More, more, more. More money, more status, more possessions, more everything. And the flip side of greed is ignoring poverty. In the time of James, widows and orphans had no status and were the poorest of the poor. They became metaphors for the poor in general. But we are certainly stained when we don't work hard enough to solve the characteristics of poverty. Hunger, homelessness, illiteracy, access to health care, liberty and justice for all. Well, lastly, I think that apathy is a cultural stain our world is experiencing. I don't care is a phrase that is increasingly defining our society. I look after me and mine and the rest of you are on your own. Stains. 
So here we are, the church of Jesus Christ, the descended and inherited church that we have from our ancestors like James and others. Well, since the apostle calls us to be doers and not just believers, what do we do about these cultural stains where we are to avoid like the plague? Well, let me rephrase that, as there are some who choose not to avoid the plague. What do we do in the encounter of the church and the world relative to our being stain resistant? H. Richard Niebuhr has some insight for us this morning, I think. Have you heard of him? He was a Christian sociologist and theologian from the middle of the last century. This Niebuhr did not get quite the acclaim that his brother Reinhold did, but he had a lot to say about the culture and the church's relationship to it. H. Richard was a professor at Eden Seminary, president of Elmhurst College, and later taught at Yale. His most widely read work is entitled Christ and Culture, and it was required reading when studying at seminary. I kind of chuckled when I cracked this classic open again for this sermon, and I saw the dedication page. The book is dedicated simply in two words, to Reine, his brother, Reinhold. When I first arrived at St. Peter's in 1984, there were a number of members who were part of then Elmhurst College and who knew the Niebuhr brothers when they were kicking around Elmhurst. One matriarch whose family name is also on a campus building, Jewel Stanger, used to refer to them as Reine and Dicky. Lots of history in our church. So what did H. Richard Niebuhr write about the encounter of the church and culture? Well, I'll stick to the highlights here because they can really inform us in our being stain resistant. The author names five ways the Church of Jesus Christ interacts with the surrounding culture. Christ against culture, the Christ of culture, Christ above culture, Christ and culture in paradox, and Christ transforming culture. A little academic, but stick with me. Let's look at each of those ways. The first is Christ against culture. This is the way of the exclusive church. The thinking goes, we are holy, the world is a bad and dirty place, so we must remain separate from the world to stay holy and convince other people to be like us. A clear example would be the Amish community who keeps to themselves and their ways. But this also applies to some fundamentalist traditions. That's Christ against culture, not really our thing. The second category is the Christ of culture. The Christ and the surrounding culture, the church and surrounding culture are meshed together. These traditions or individuals who follow them see no line between the church and the culture. This includes phrases, phrases like one nation under God or we are a Christian nation. Some would say that this is the culture driving the church or seeking to. The third kind of relationship is Christ above culture. Now, this is one that seeks synthesis. The church and the culture blend together as partners, but the church still understands itself to be the better of the pair. We need the law and the world and the monetary system in order to function, but ultimately communing with God in the afterlife is more important. Now, the fourth way the church and culture interact is that they are in paradox. This is dualism. The church is on one end, the culture is on the other, and that tension is maintained. Let's keep them separate, just like the earliest church was separate from the Roman Empire, even though they were a part of that empire. This says the culture needs the church as its moral compass, and the church needs the culture so it can exist in the real world. 
And although they're very separate, they're both necessary. Some would say that this is what Reinhold Niebuhr believed. Ah, but then there's the last category that H. Richard provides us with. Christ as transformer of the culture. This is about conversion or changing the culture. Older examples of the church transforming culture for positive change involved most of the schools and healthcare institutions in our country being originally founded by faith traditions. God is present in the here and now. The civil rights movement, the peace movement. So instead of simply avoiding being stained, we need to transform those systems that make the stains. This is any modern prophetic movement for social justice, which reflects the prophetic tone of scripture. This is the kind of church that is concerned less with what may happen in our relationship with God in the future, i.e. going to heaven, and more with seeking change now based on God's call to us through scripture. It's no coincidence that this finds expression in ministries of mission and social justice. It's also no coincidence that this is what Niebuhr believed to be the role of the church in its relationship with the culture that surrounds and permeates our lives to be transformative. Nor should it be surprising that he was part of the German evangelical and reformed tradition that helped birth the United Church of Christ. Be doers. But let's also shout it out. Amen. This service has ended. Our service now begins. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen.